Up All Night with Rod Sharp. Boston Sailor completes solo voyage around the world, read a headline last month in the Boston Globe. For understatement, this almost competes with the Aberdeen Press and Journal's famous Aberdeen Man Lost at Sea on the sinking of the Titanic. It's understated on several counts. By sailing around the world in 107 days and 48 minutes, 66-year-old Rich Wilson not only became the oldest man to complete the Vendée Globe race, but he became the fastest American single-handed circumnavigator ever, beating the previous record by two days. And he's done it before. 350,000 people visited the little Brittany port of Les Sables d'Olon between the start of the race November the 6th and the return of the last finisher on March the 11th. 29 boats started, 18 completed, including the only Briton, Alex Thompson from Bangor, who finished a fabulous second. The rest of us, including Wilson's fellow Americans, seemed to be giving it the Gallic shrug. But as Wilson told me back home in Marblehead, the French are all over it. They're incredibly interested to talk to you. They, uh, they want uh, always to have a picture with their kids and you um, uh, sign an autograph. I mean, it's kind of amazing for a sailor because that doesn't happen here in the U.S. But they appreciate the effort. They've thought about the race. They followed the race. They know which continent has Cape Horn. They know where the Kerguelen Islands are. They know that you're going to be thousands of miles from land at certain points of it, and they, and that it's going to be a huge uh, emotional, physical, mental task, and uh, and that generally half the fleet doesn't finish the race um, for breakage of boats or injuries. And um, tell me about some of the individuals yeah. that you met. You know, after you finished. Uh, the, well. Um, when I was actually, I stayed until the last finisher finished, Sebastian Destremo. Um, I should say the final finisher. He mm-hmm. wasn't last. He, there were 11 boats that didn't finish. So, right. so 18 out of 29 yeah, finished. 18 out of 29. And, uh, and when I was taking the train back to Paris, I met people in the train station who had come. They weren't sailors. Uh, two had come from Paris. One came from uh, Tours in uh, the central France just to be there to see the final finisher arrive. And they felt that he deserved every bit as much credit as the winner. Um, and uh, there's a long channel that enters the, the harbor, and it's uh, sort of a geographic advantage for Les Alolone for this race because what it permits is that at the start of the race, when this time 350,000 people came that morning to the start of the race, they're able to get very close to the to the boats as they go out because it's a very narrow channel and there's piers on both sides and uh, so I walked out to the end of one of the piers. I'd never been out there before and it was a weekday and there were weren't too many people out walking but uh, there was one guy that came by and he kind of did a double take as he walked by me and then he came back and he asked if I was Rich Wilson and I said yes and he started crying. And he excused himself, and he said, I'm sorry, it's just very moving to meet you. And, um, wow. you know, a real skipper who had just sailed around the world by himself. And um, so we talked for about 15 or 20 minutes, and, and uh, they know how it went. And they remember episodes that happened with each of the different boats. And they, um, it's a phenomenal connection that's made between the general public most of whom are not sailors, um, the vast majority of whom are not sailors, and this event. And there's something in the humanism, in the culture of France that I think al- that, that allows this, uh, perhaps more than other places, um, where um, maybe it's the egalite fraternite, that, that uh, we're sort of all in this together, and they believe that. And, um, it's just a, it, it's magical, and, and they're so interested in it, and their the kids are interested in it, and they they when when the race village opens three weeks before the start of the race, the entire fleet is there, and over the course of that time, there's thirty five thousand people every day walk that dock to see the boats and to talk to the skippers and. The, the skippers and the shore crews are completely accessible. You know, if I come back here, I, I can't go talk to Tom Brady. 
but anybody on the dock in Les Sables alone can go talk to Arna Le Clash, or they might see Yves Parlier walk down the dock, or they might see uh, Michel Desjoyeaux, who's a two-time winner, and they can go talk to him, and he'll talk to them. And that's just magical. Um, and I think that there's, there's something in the fact that the solo sailors versus fully crewed sailboat races um, they've all had the daylight scared out of them many several to many times at sea because the boats are big and powerful and they're a long way from help and uh, the waves can get very 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 big by contrast you come back here <laughs> to the, uh, dry land yeah. you are the record holder yeah. for an american sailing around the world and it must be somewhat underwhelming when your fellow country people just go, oh, hello, Rich, have you been away? <laughs> well, that's about, that's about the, <laughs> so approximately the reception, yes. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? <laughs> um, but uh, hopefully we've, we make you know, little bits of inroads uh, into telling the story about the race. And um, I think sailing in the U.S. has a... Uh, is viewed by many as sort of being elitist sport and so forth, but I can assure you that there's nothing elitist about being a Southern Ocean gale in a 60-foot boat alone a thousand miles from land. Um, and uh, what goes on within this race, um, I think um, Americans, if they, Americans that we've talked to who did get to f follow the race or started following it, whether they were sort of friends or friends of friends or through our uh, newspaper publications uh, to schools and so forth. Uh, once they get hooked, they're just hooked and they start to follow it every day, two times a day, three times a day is sort of the standard. First thing in the morning, what's happening in the race, last thing at night, what's happening, you know, anticipating weather through the night sometime during the day. And that's not uncommon and we've had people um, say, uh, I don't know what to do with myself now. Can you please go back to sea? <laughs> and we, we declined. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the, uh, the drama of the event, um, the, the uh, solo nature of it, the length of it, the, how hard it is, how you know, boats are breaking, skippers are getting hurt, uh, there's a lot of drama in it, and uh, it goes around the world. I mean, what other event does that? No other event. Yeah. Talk about drama. I mean, the Welsh uh, skipper Alex Thompson eventually finished second, but very early on in the race, his very high-tech boat, the Hugo Boss, mm -hmm. lost a foil, yeah. which meant he was like a, a goose with one wing nearly all the way. Did you think when he lost that foil, well, he's out? Uh, no, um, because it's not um, going to be destructive of the boat. It's a, it's really something that's going to increase his speed, but the boat itself will still be intact and will be safe and so forth. So he'll keep going, or I would expect he would keep going. Um, uh, and so it you know would slow him down some in the Southern Ocean. Uh, in the Atlantic coming back up after Cape Horn, then he'll be on the other tack most of the time. So his one good foil will be in the in the water most of the time. And we did, um, when I was in France, I had a chance to visit with um, a guy who actually built the foils for Armel Le Clash, who was the winner. And he said that Armel was very cautious with them in the south so that he would sort of save them for the Atlantic coming back. Uh, and so it didn't fully use them, um, but yeah. Did you uh, did you miss having any high tech aids? I mean, I know you you talk about we when yeah. when you're out there, you're single handed, but you, it's you and the boat, isn't it? And your boat, Great American Four, came back. If I, I quote the Vendee Globe uh, people, and they said that that you came back without even a rope out of place. They said. The boat returned in almost exactly the same near-perfect condition as they left. <laughs> You're very much a team then, you and the boat. Yes, absolutely. It's I can't do it without the boat. The boat can't do it without me. And so we are a team. We're partners, shipmates um, at sea. Yeah. And uh, I, we didn't have foils on the boat, but I think that 
Um, we still have a very high tech boat. Um, we still hit over 30 knots twice, and which is um, something I never ever in my life wanted to do. And it happened by accident twice. <laughs> <laughs> the second time I don't know when it happened. It must have happened when I was asleep or on deck or someplace in the boat doing something. And uh, but um, uh, I think that the foils, which have gotten a lot of attention can only be fully utilized by the top skippers and uh, uh, the ones who are really in contention to possibly win the race. And of the 29 skippers that started the race, there were only eight or nine of those, seven, eight or nine, who really would stand a chance to, to win the race. And the, the, the rest of us, I would say, are in it to for a variety of reasons. Well, why um, did you do it then? Because you've yeah. done this before. Right. You've sailed single-handed around the world yeah. once before. Yes, yeah, so we sailed the 2008-2009 race, um, which had 30 skippers in it and only 11 finished. Um, so there were 19 that dropped out along the way, injuries, breakage of the boat, and so forth. So the reason to do it again was the Sites Alive program, which is our uh, school uh, program. We've been creating programs off of live adventures and expeditions, field research stations now for 25 years and uh, to get kids excited in the classroom about learning. If you give them a big adventure and they don't know what's going to happen next, they start to pay attention, which solves the biggest problem for a school teacher. And we have a curriculum that's tied to standards and uh, correlated to standards and uh, it, it all works fabulously well. And so our idea in 2008 2009 race was that we tried to make a global school program and in the end it ended up being in the U.S. We had about a quarter million students in the U.S. but we had interest from around the world but we hadn't been able to pull that all together so the idea of going again was let's start earlier let's make those connections around the world and in the end we had 700,000 students in 55 countries with major partners in France, the French Ministry of Education, a major partner in Taiwan, a major partner in China. Um, and so that we did actually create, therefore, the global school program. And that was our goal, to use the excitement and the drama and the science, the geography, the math that's inherent in the Vendée Globe in an offshore voyage like that um, as the hook for this big school program, and it worked marvelously. I, I'm going to play a little bit of the, the podcast now uh, that you made. Every day you made a little podcast report, sometimes when you weren't feeling pretty crash hot, I, I gather. Uh, but here's one day, and you're off the coast of Morocco. You're off Agadir in Morocco. And there are students of yours on the quayside. Isn't that right? Y yes, we were... We were, I don't know how many, 800 miles offshore or something, like 500 miles off the coast when we went by. But but when we heard about that, uh, that they were there, it was at what la uh, latitude was their school. And so when we sailed past that latitude, I made a little video of the horizon showing where it was. A nice little video today for uh, one of our site live classes that's in Agadir, Morocco. They said they were going to go down to the beach there. We're only a half a half a kilometer from the beach and uh, look out to sea when we were at about the same latitude. So we reciprocated with a short video of greeting to them as the Budlow's class there in Agadir. And so that, that was really nice. I had a very long night last night where the weather conditions were variable as a charitable way to say it. Uh, four knots to 22 knots. 100 degree wind shift almost every hour and uh, sails coming and going and just very difficult, made very little progress. I mean, the stress of the race is continual and you're just always waiting for something to go wrong. And uh, so sometimes, and you're so tired, sometimes I would try to cry to break the tension, which sounds like an odd thing for sport. But um, uh, and, and it, it never happened until I got a picture from a school in India that was holding up their Sites Alive certificates for having completed our program. And when I saw that, I just burst into tears at the chart table because that was what this was all about. And it was we didn't have a big partner in India. It was just a teacher found out about it and started to follow the program in India and 
that made my day and my month and <laughs> really the whole race just about to see that picture. Let's talk about your journey a little bit. Last time out, you were crossing the Bay of Biscay in a foul storm and you fell across a boat and you broke three ribs and you sailed with three broken ribs. Now this time, uh, nothing like that happens, but it was still pretty rough. Yeah, we didn't uh, have any problems like that. Um, but the violence of the boats is really beyond description almost. I know that Dominic Vav, who was the skipper who had the boat built originally, and we were able to get it from him uh, into, in 2013. When he was in the 2012 race, he fractured vertebrae on the foredeck by being thrown into the air, and then the boat came back to meet him, and he landed right on the bottom of his spine. And He uh, didn't tell anybody about it. He kept sailing. And I, um, I've, in addition to the broken ribs for the 2008 race, previously, previous to that, we I had fractured a vertebrae on that boat by being thrown across the cabin on a different voyage. And um, I can assure you that a fractured vertebrae is far more painful than broken ribs. And somehow he sailed for a month with a fractured vertebra. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, the skippers are tough. The boats are violent. Um, there was one of the young skippers who was uh, right up in the, in the lead group, probably sixth, seventh or so, uh, going to the Pacific. He'd had an episode where I think it was on his qualifying race. He broke f five or six ribs. And uh, uh, it's pretty serious uh, what's going on out there on these big boats. They're 60 feet long, 90 foot mast, 15 feet deep and 18 feet wide. And they're a somewhat similar profile to the 12 meters that used to be used in the America's Cup in Newport a long time ago. Um, but they're much more powerful than that and you don't have the extra 10 guys on board and you don't come in for lunch. Yeah, you don't have 10 <laughs> guys on board and you don't come in for lunch. That, that would suggest to me that the America's Cup is, is not top of your hit parade. Well, I think the America's Cup has turned into a very high technology, and uh, the races now are 30 minutes long. And uh, the, um, I will quote one of the French uh, uh, offshore skippers who's also participating in the America's Cup, Loic Peyron, or did in the last America's Cup. He said, you know, now you just need a helmsman and a mainsail trimmer and a bunch of hamsters to grind the... Uh, grind the hydraulic pressure, which is what they're doing. And uh, so, um, and there's a lot of help around if something goes wrong, because you're sailing in a bay and it's calm seas, and if it blows over 23 knots, you go home. And uh, so it's different. <laughs> let's, let's hear another uh, bit from your podcast. And, um, and this one is from the 25th of January. And the quote here, which we'll hear, is... Um, we just got clobbered through the night with 30 knots of wind, upwind, into the big building seas and crashing and crashing and crashing. Just got clobbered through the night with 30 knots of wind, upwind, into the, the building seas and big seas and crashing and crashing and crashing. And it's just, the uh, conditions just chaotic. And I uh, put a video up uh, looking out the back of the boat just to give an idea. Uh, Really nothing you can do on the boat because you just have to be holding on at all times with all four limbs. You know, we've been in the South Atlantic, uh, coming up the South Atlantic. That was a night, you know, we had um, north winds for 35 to 40 knots, and uh, that built up a sea over the course of time to probably 15 to 18 foot seas, and then suddenly it died and it went to zero. And five minutes later, it came back 35 to 40 knots from a different direction, from the west, which then started to create a new uh, set of waves that were crossing the old set of waves. And it was complete chaos. It was like being in a washing machine with 15 to 20 foot seas coming from every direction. And the boat is... Uh, very buoyant, and it responds to that, to every every wave like like that. And it's, uh, um, I remember one time, not that particular incident, but another time in the uh, in the Pacific, the beginning of the Pacific, after we got past New Zealand, there was a big storm, and 
um, we got kind of knocked over and the boat's laying at about 60 degrees or so and trying to recover it all. And I felt that the uh, I had to do the maneuvers in the cockpit from sitting on the cockpit floor because I thought that if a wave hit the bottom of the boat, I would get catapulted right out of the cockpit over the side. Uh, and that would be that would be that. Was the Southern Ocean the worst of it? This this huge expanse of just for us nothing, and for you, positions on a chart. Um, I saw a ship off Brazil when I went past there, a warship. I, I spoke with. They came over to investigate sort of who I was, and we chatted with them. And then I saw a fishing boat off Tierra del Fuego, ten thousand miles later. That was the next boat, um, and then another ship off Brazil, and that was it. So going around the world, there in the south, there's really nothing. Um, Eric Bellion uh, did sail by one day, and he we, we ended up being very close, and I saw him. Uh, he was going a little faster. and uh, So we had a nice chat on the VHF as he was going by, and that was okay. <laughs> you know, it's just fine. He was really happy, and uh, he was very complimentary. He, he did a great video saying, you know, isn't this amazing? There's the rituals, and he's 66 years old. He's asthmatic. He's looking at him go. You know, it's great. <laughs> but he was going a little faster, but it didn't matter. You know, the, the position at the end of the race uh, matters for the first three, and for everybody else, it doesn't really matter. The goal is finish the race. Did you feel that you were being tortured? I mean, how, how much sleep can you possibly get? The sleep is really a problem, that's for sure. And um, uh, all the skippers have similar problem. And um, I've had hallucinations at sea before. I didn't have any this time. Uh, or not that I remember anyway. <laughs> but I had, had some pretty good ones last time. <laughs> yeah. what, what kind of things? Giant mermaids or something? No, no. Well, yeah. Nothing as exciting. No, I wish. <laughs> no, in 2008, 2009, I, I imagined, and I, it was right in between sleeping and being awake, that I had to download a 20-ton anchor through the satellite telephone to the boat. And the problem that I saw was not that you can't do that, but the but the problem was that the high speed satellite telephone, the high baud rate was malfunctioning. So I was gonna to have to download this through the low baud rate uh, satellite telephone and this was just gonna take forever. <laughs> and I can tell you that I struggled with that while I was wide awake for about eighteen hours. This dilemma of how this how am I going to download this thing and then I finally realized after about 18 hours that no I didn't actually have to download the anchor through the satellite are you very beaten up are you very beaten up physically um, pretty pretty beaten up now yeah that what happens is your legs atrophy over the course of time because they're not being used so a lot of the training beforehand and I spent two years training with a world champion cyclist who lives here in Marblehead and was a all-American distance runner as well. Um, and uh, a lot of the training is for the legs first so that you're super strong in your legs so that you can deteriorate with your legs um, and still have something left at the end. Um, and I, I'd say the last three weeks I felt that I was highly aware that my, I didn't think my legs could save me if they needed to. And so I was super careful the last three weeks. They weren't strong enough. And you get stronger and stronger and stronger up top because you're grinding winches all day long. And we had a counter on the pedestal winch in the cockpit. And so I, that was averaging out at about 1,200 revolutions per day. Um, and sometimes if there was a heavy day, it might be 3,000 revolutions. And these are loaded revolutions. These are not easy spinning the winch revolutions. Mm -hmm. Right now, so it's been three weeks since I finished, um, you know, my arms still hurt uh, and my shoulders still hurt from it. And I'm not sure how long it's going to take for that to settle down. It feels like everything, nothing was broken, nothing was pulled apart, but it feels like everything was just severely strained. Um, and I did actually pose a question at one point to the to the emergency doctor um, uh, whether in fact you could 
expend such an effort on you know, certain muscles that they just would stop and they wouldn't respond. And your brain would say, okay, we need another revolution, and it wouldn't go. Your arms wouldn't go. Um, because I think I was getting pretty close to that sometimes, um, that just stopping. Uh, so it's a huge physical effort. Uh, and uh, it was, I guess, reassuring when uh, my young friend Alan Rura would say he was just exhausted. He just can't, just just exhausted trying to sail a boat. It's so physical. And so he is 43 years younger than me. And so that was, was like, okay, good. I, I understand. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. It was nice to be in touch with those guys along the way. <laughs>